you're in the water loop. <laughs> Hi, this is Travis with Waterloop. I'm a huge fan of High Sierra shower heads for many reasons, including how they are incredibly water efficient, they provide tremendous water pressure, and they're made from solid metal with no plastic parts. I also love supporting a small business that's based in the High Sierra foothills where their team designs and assembles all of the shower heads with parts from suppliers in California. This is a U.S. company. I've spent time talking with owner David Malcolm. He's concerned about the pressures facing our water resources and wants to make a difference. That's why he's focused his company on water conservation and energy efficiency. High Sierra Showerheads is exactly the type of product and company that's worth our support. Use promo code WATERLOOP for 20% off at HighSierraShowerheads.com. Waterloop, Waterloop, Waterloop. Welcome to Waterloop. This is Travis. For this episode, I am joined by Jeremy Orr. He is a staff attorney and involved with the Safe Water Initiative at the Natural Resources Defense Council. Jeremy, I'm glad we could catch up for this podcast. Travis, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Could you talk a little bit about your path that kind of led you to this point where you're working in water for NRDC and really focused up there on on, on safe water uh, in the in Michigan and Illinois? Absolutely. So I, you know, I have a what I would consider to be a very unique path, especially you know coming to work with a, a large institution like NRDC. Uh, you know, it's been around for 50 years and, and you know, has, has been kind of a, a giant in terms of policy and, and litigation. Uh, you know, my background actually comes, uh, you know, out of organizing. I come out of grassroots community organizing. So uh, out of college, I got my start as a um, community organizer in Michigan doing kind of church based, uh, institution based organizing uh, from a model of, you know, really, you know, pounding the pavement, literally right. Knocking the doors and, and organizing churches and community groups to you know work on issues of transportation and affordable housing. Uh, youth violence and drug prevention. And uh, one of the issues that we worked on, uh, which kind of prompted me to, to really take a, 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 an interest in environmental advocacy, in particular environmental justice, was the cleanup of a, a contaminated Superfund site uh, in a community in, uh, you know, in, in where I was working at the time in, in Kalamazoo. Uh, during the cleanup, uh, you know, of this, the Superfund site, we were trying to engage the EPA and the state environmental department in the city. And what stood out to me more than anything was uh, none of the people in these spaces that were making decisions uh, were, you know, were people that reflected the community, right? There were black and brown people impacted by this injustice and all the folks, you know, in the decision making processes, all the attorneys, all the policymakers, all the elected officials predominantly were, you know, middle aged white males, really. Um, and that kind of prompted me to say, man, there is a, you know, there's a real need for, you know, people, you know, that look like me and from the communities that I come from to be at the table, to be a voice and to make that space. And, um, and then I began to learn more about, you know, environmental law, environmental advocacy and, and, and ultimately environmental justice and uh, made the decision that, you know, I wanted to be one of those people uh, at the table who could who could understand the language that was being spoken of, you know, environmental law and policy, and, um, you know, be there to advocate not just for myself, and not just for my community, but to create the space to bring other people to that table. Uh, and that was kind of my route. So, you know, I left organizing after about three years. Uh, went to law school specifically to study environmental and civil rights law and, you know, graduated and did just that. And, you know, had a path of, uh, you know, practice at a, a law clinic in Detroit, the Transnational Environmental Law Clinic, uh, you know, ended up leaving there, got back into national organizing around uh, climate justice and environmental health and eventually led, you know, to, you know, some of my, my work with uh, NRDC. Yeah, you're like you said. You're with one of the heavyweights right now, NRDC. They do awesome stuff. I'm glad they're uh, they're led by uh, one of my former bosses, the head of EPA, Gina McCarthy. That was a big a big score, I think, for NRDC getting a fighter like her in there. Um, and I, it seems like there's a, a lot of different people that have been involved in community organizing and community outreach that end up kind of getting into the environmental advocacy a little yeah. bit. Um, seems like a, a good transition. I know you also were, were an athlete at Michigan State, you know, played football and, and all that. Is there anything you learned kind of uh, from your athletic career that, that carries over to the environmental fight? Absolutely, man. One of the things that I noticed, even when I kind of got into the job market following college and, you know, was trying to get into organizing in the nonprofit sector and, and even throughout, you know, uh, you know, 
careers in law and post law school, it, it was people really valued, uh, uh, you know, those who, who took part in athletics at a high level. And I think it was all these transferable skills that it took me a while to realize that, you know, off the field and off the track, like people, you know, people value teamwork and people value the hard work and dedication it took to balance, you know, for me, not just one sport, but two sports at a, you know, at a high level, at a big 10 level, um, you know, they, they, they value just the, the commitment, right. And, and dedication of that. And, and those were always pretty transferable. I just didn't, you know, I didn't realize that, you know, I learned them from, you know, from sports and, and that they would then, you know, go from, from sports to, you know, kind of the work that I do now. And I think even the work that I do now within RDC as an attorney, it's the, the, competitive edge that I have, right, of, of, of knowing that, um, you know, the stakes, you know, if I could do this in football and track, the stakes are even higher when we're talking about people's health and well-being and lives are at stake. And, and that kind of is something that continues to drive me that I learned from sports, right, just the competitive nature to to want to win, right? Yeah, I love that. That's awesome. Yeah, I, it's amazing. Always amaze me, guys like you, girls that are going to college, taking all those classes, doing all that stuff. And then, I mean, you guys have rigorous practice schedules, games, meets, all that. And you just, yeah. you know, you put in the work, that's for sure. Um, environmental justice, you know, it's it's always uh, it's always been a topic um, past couple decades, but it's really risen to prominence uh, the past few months. Obviously, with all these uh, killings of Black Americans and looking at equity in this country, we'll we'll dive into that a little bit. But what what does environmental justice mean to you? How do you define that? Right, I, you know, it, it's I think that's a really important question, right? I think you know we we tend to. Most folks are used to kind of that that EPA definition, right? The fair treatment and meaningful involvement of, of people regardless of, you know, race, religion, income, so on and so on, right? And, and it deals with protecting those communities. Uh, and that's all well and good, man. But I think for me, what that definition is lacking, which I would, you know, would love to see in a, a better definition and, and, and what I hold as my definition is, uh, one, right, um, I, I think it, a definition that includes uh, remedying uh, historic and, and past environmental injustices. Right. So not just, you know, from from this point, we're going to protect you. But, you know, let's let's do something to make up for the harm that was intentionally or unintentionally done, to, to, you know, to, to these EJ communities over the years. Uh, and I think the other piece of that is, um, you know, the, the definition I just mentioned. Right. It, it lacks any reference to, um, you know, it, it lacks any forward thinking reference. Right. So it lacks, re it lacks references to benefits or access or really opportunities. Right. And I, and I think that's the piece that's missed. Right. Environmental justice. It also, you know, can't just be merely about let's protect you from, you know, imminent danger, pending harm, but also in the space in which, OK, we've tackled that. Can we also do things to move your community forward? You know, the, the otherwise, you know, underserved and overburdened communities forward uh, in terms of, of, of benefits to that community. Right. It, it's, a, you know, we don't tend to be the communities that get the parks and the green space and we don't have the recycling, you know, that's picked up every week in our communities. Right. So starting to be more forward thinking uh, as it relates to environmental justice is, is kind of how I define it as well. I like I like what you pointed out there that kind of the, the definition that's out there is a little bit about just the present in a way. It's missing the past. It's missing the yeah. future. Right. Kind of the whole yeah. spectrum there. That's good. Um, how how is in addressing environmental justice part of like the bigger picture of delivering equity for for Black Americans and other people of color? Yeah, it's that's a big question. Me, right, that's a big question. You know, no, it, it it is a big question. But for me, there's there's nothing more significant than the kind of the physical health and well being of of human beings, right? So, and and there's nothing that plays a greater role in that than the physical environment that you interact with every day, right? So when I think of, of, of equity and, and, and justice as it relates to a plethora of issues, especially those, you know, facing the black community, um, you know, I, I think of, of like health being wealth, right? Like you hear the phrase all the time, but that, man, that's like, it's never been more true to me, especially the times that we're living in now and working in the environmental space of, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, the overburdened communities that are, are kept from, you know, having the good jobs and making it to work because we don't have, you know, solid public transportation. It's it's our kids that are missing school because the air quality in the community is is, you know, is raising, you know, asthma rates and, and respiratory disease rates. It's it's um, you know, it's, it's our communities that are not able to eat healthy because we live in food deserts. Right. And, and don't have access to fresh produce and, and, and quality foods or, or the ones that we do have access to. They're astronomically high and we can't afford them. And it, it's 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 also kind of keeping us from 
you know, these environmental injustices, keeping us from enjoying our, our loved ones in, in, in the outdoors and space in, in ways that uh, other communities are able to, right? Because we, we, we either don't have, I mentioned, right, green space and park and stuff. Either we don't have the quality spaces to go out and, and be in, in community and fellowship with one another. And the ones that we do, you know, they, they tend to have the story I gave you, tend to be contaminated, right? Or, or tend to be, you know, hot spots for, you know, poor air quality or, or the lakes and rivers that we would otherwise get to play in tend to be contaminated. Uh, so I think there it's, it's kind of this holistic picture mm-hmm. of, of all of these implications uh, that are, you know, to me tied to, you know, systemic structural racism uh, that play out in, in the environmental realm very tangibly. Yeah. Health is wealth. I like that. You know, <clears throat> they always say if, if you don't have your health, you know, what, what do you have? Or if you have your health, you really have everything too, you know? Um, yeah. Key, good point. Um, shifting, digging into water a little bit and drinking water specifically, um, could you talk about some of the ways that, that racism and discriminatory practices kind of created inequitable access to, to drinking water? Maybe yeah, maybe so even I, some of those communities that you're familiar with. Oh. Yeah, yeah. The, the the best way I've heard this described was was by a mentor of mine, and it's and it stuck with me for for years when I first started, you know, practicing law, and in particular in the environmental law area. Um, you know, he, he had described uh, environmental law and environmental enforcement to be similar to um, law enforcement and criminal justice system, right? And it was if you're if you're white or if you're you're wealthy and have access to money and resources. You'll get, you'll at least get the shot at justice. You'll have access to justice, right? And not, not, not saying you'll know, play out in your favor, but you'll get a fair shot, um, right? And, and you know, you'll, you'll, you'll make it home, right? If, if you're stopped by the police, mm-hmm. right? You, you'll get your day in court, basically, and you'll have that fair access to justice. Um, if you're black, right? Not so much, right? As, as, as we've seen play out uh, in the criminal justice system and law enforcement, you know, system as well, right? Not historically, but even what we're going through right now at right this now. present point in, in, yeah. in the country that we're seeing every, every day, right? Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, for us, it's the, when I think of the criminal justice system, it's the, you know, it's the high arrest rates. It's the, the over-prosecution, overcharging. It's the mass incarceration, right? It's the the, the new Jim Crow, right? It, it's the, you know, you're, you're killed by police at higher rates, right? And, and the list goes on and on. Now you think about the, the environmental law and environmental enforcement as well, and in particular around, you know, drinking water. Uh, you know, our communities tend to pay you know, higher bills, right? Higher water bills. Um, you know, our, our communities that built and owned, you know, particularly I'm from Detroit, right? Where we built and owned the water system are now paying, you know, some of the highest bills in the country to subsidize suburban white communities so they can pay, you know, cheaper rates for, for quality water. Um, it's, it's, we have higher shutoff rates, right? It's, um, you know, the, the higher rates of, of violations of Safe Drinking Water Act, uh, you know, violations which go you know, which go unchecked in, in black communities, right? And le- obviously leading to higher, you know, exposure to toxins in our water. Um, and, and whether that be intentional, like by design, or whether it just be a, a, a byproduct impact of, of poor policy, it, it disproportionately uh, impacts our community and is rooted in structural racism. So whenever I think of, you know, environmental enforcement and overall kind of discriminatory practices, man, it, it, it parallels the, the criminal justice system for me. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, Detroit, there, you know, you might know that Tiffany, uh, Tiffany Ashley Bell, who had the human utility, where they work to pay mm-hmm. people's uh, pay people's bills for them a little bit. Yeah. And yeah. Um, yeah. I one of the things that's going on is, um, you know, white folks trying to a, a number of them and us, whatever, trying to better educate themselves on the injustices and on the lack of equity. Um, on, on the environmental front, do you have any suggestions for how people can can become more informed, more aware of of the challenges that are faced? I do, right? And, 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 and that's an important question, right, which I think oftentimes doesn't get asked, which is, you know, how can I, you know, how can I find out more? I, I want to be involved. I want to help. Or at, or at the very least, I want to understand what's going on, right? How do I get more? And I think there's, there's, of course, no shortage of information out there. But I think, you know, even starting with um, you know, on the water side, I think of, you know, NRDC has a report that we released yet last year called uh, Water Down Justice, right? Our senior, uh, one of our, our senior um, scientists, uh, Christy pullen you know, partnered with EJ Health Alliance and Coming Clean, right? And this study analyzed uh, nationwide violations on Safe Drinking Water Act from 20, 2016 to 2019, right? And it, and it explored the relationship between 
race and, and drinking water violations. And of course, you know, it showed that drinking water violations were more likely to occur uh, in communities of color, especially black communities. So that's called, you know, watered down justice is a place to start. And I think of air quality issues. I think of NAACP and, and uh, fumes across the fence line report that was released a few years ago. And I think it may have gotten updated as well, uh, you know, within the last year or so. I think they partnered with uh, the Clean Air Task Force to release this report that looked at and that the health impacts of, of air pollution on uh, well, from oil and gas, you know, facilities on African American communities, right? It's it's things like that, and then even the the, the thing that I think that is is still you know so crazy to me because it's still so relevant, but uh, toxic waste and race, right? The the original 1987 kind of landmark report on you know hazardous waste siting in communities of color, you know, being two and three times more likely to to be in you know poor black and brown or uh, communities, right? That report came out in 1987, and they did an update in the 20 year report. So they did an update in 2007. Right. Um, and even that is just like, man, there, and, and I, I would imagine even today, like not much has changed, right? It, it's still, you know, EJ communities that are taking the brunt of, of, you know, all of the issues, water, air, and of course, you know, has this waste kind of uncontrolled, you know, sites in, in our communities. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the issue that I started off saying, which kind of introduced me to environmental justice and as a community organizer, that was, you know, a contaminated site. Right, that was just in a community for decades, uncontrolled. Right, so I, I think those are those three are just you know really good places to start to give you some historical context, uh, as well as present day uh, context on you know what black communities are are facing on these issues. Yeah, and you just gave three examples, like you said, water, air, yeah. land. It's it's you know everywhere yeah. everywhere you turn uh, for sure. Um, one of the things is I like to to talk about I want to ask you about is the environmental field you know it's pretty overwhelmingly white right the, the staffs of organizations the membership memberships of a lot of organizations um, just kind of want to get your perspective on that and and what it's been like or is like for you as, as a black man working in a in a pretty overwhelmingly white field yeah um, and it's you know it's not easy at all right and I think for for me you know I, I get it kind of twice, right? So I'm a black man working in the environmental field in and of itself is predominantly white, but I'm also an attorney working in that space, right? And, and there aren't a lot of, you know, black attorneys, period, right? Across any field. So uh, so to be a, you know, a black attorney working in the environmental space, like it's even more narrow <laughs> for me, right? And, and I think um, I'm, all, I'm very hyper aware of it. But as I mentioned, you know, earlier, like that's, that's the reason I got into this work, right? I didn't, growing up, I didn't have some, some affinity for nature and the environment. You know, I grew up in inner city Detroit, like in the hood, right? There, there weren't the green spaces, there weren't the parks, there weren't the lakes. Like I didn't grow up, you know, kind of exposed to nature to kind of grow that love for it. So for me, it's always been about uh, public health, right? And, and, and protecting the communities most vulnerable and, and being able to be in that space. So um, while it's, it's, it's not difficult, it's, it's never, um, you know, it's never been a space that I, you know, didn't want to be in for the sake of representation. And I think too, Right. It, it's it's, you know, as I mentioned, it's about advocating for the issues, uh, you know, that I care about and know that that they impact communities. But it's also about like being in the space to create space for more people. Right. That that, that look like me and come from communities that I come from. Right. And, and being able to say, OK, let, like we, we need more chairs at this table. Right. I, I don't need to be at this table. I'm, I may not be part of this impacted community, but somebody should be. And I think that's the part of that kind of you know, makes it much more manageable, right? Because I think too, as we've been seeing, you know, coming out a lot of months, kind of big green institutions over the last few months, a lot of kind of media reports and past employees, you know, signing on the letters and, and creating op-eds about the institutional issues that they face uh, with their own organizations. And I think that's, a, that's, you know, probably any institution, but I think we're at least working in a space where these, in, in particular environmental organizations are trying to get it right, right? They're, they're trying to move in the right direction. And I think that makes it uh, much more manageable when you're working with, you know, people and institutions that uh, run a remedy, you know, their their past wrongs and harms and, and want to make a more uh, diverse, equitable and inclusive space. I, you know, for me the right now, being at one of the largest, you know, big greens, seeing that work take place right before my eyes while I'm here to, to see DEI being taken seriously and, and being uh, pushed along in a meaningful way is, is important. We got a lot of work to do. Right. And, and but I'm glad to be 
a part of that work and, and help move that forward. I think that's really powerful that you, like you said in the very beginning, you didn't see people like you in these positions, right? And that instead of being like, well, then I can't go into this, you actually took the opposite yeah. approach. Like, you know what? I need to be in here so that there's someone like me representing. And then that's also awesome how you say, you know, some young person might now see you out there fighting yeah. for water, you know, and, and they can then envision themselves g growing up or, or going into school and, and following in your footsteps. Yeah. And it, you know, and it happens all the time and I get, you know, countless emails from, you know, black law students and even, you know, brown law students or, or students looking at going into, you know, maybe policy degrees and, uh, who are just saying, you know, I was, I was looking at, you know, the NRDC website or I was, you know, Googling, you know, environmentalists of color or, you know, and, and came across your LinkedIn and, and they're just, uh, they're just glad to be able to see somebody that looks like them in this space and, and be able to connect. And for me, man, like I'm, that's why I got into the work. So I'm always happy, man, and excited to, to try to mentor and shepherd along other folks, you know, who are, are trying to, to really engage in this work. Yeah. Um, let's, let's talk about solutions and successes a little bit here. Um, what are, what are some of the solutions you'd like to see when it comes to delivering equity and, in, in, you know, the access and, and safety of, of drinking water? What do you, what do you think are some things you, you'd like to see, especially in, you know, your work up there? Yeah, I, I think at the most basic level, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm on the, you know, Safe Water Initiative at NRDC. And, and our main goal is to, you know, really fight for, you know, safe, clean, affordable water and ultimately secure water as a human right. Like the, 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 the ultimate idea would be, you know, to, to see uh, drinking water, access to drinking water codified as a human right, like nationally, right, in some way, shape or form, like, like, like secure that, uh, secure that right so that no matter what, you know, people have this access to water. That's the ultimate goal. But, you know, short of that, as we continue to work towards that, I think it's about, you know, can we can we set can we make water affordable? Right. Can we at least make sure that people can afford it and have access to it regardless of income uh or ability to pay, right? And, and I think rather that looks like some sort of equitable, you know, rate structures or, or some moratoriums that continue to, you know, to, to moratoriums on shutoffs that we've seen during COVID that continue to at least say, okay, at the most basic level, we're not going to shut off water of our vulnerable communities, right? Our low income communities, right? We're, we're not, we're at least going to target this population and say at no point, you know, if they can't afford it, they should still have, you know, they should maintain access to water. And I think the last thing, kind of like I mentioned, you know, just the, the, you know, black communities, you know, being more susceptible to violations of say drinking water. A right? like, big part of that is just accountability, man. Like the, 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 the enforcers, right. The, the EPAs and the, and the state environmental agencies actually taking the steps to say, okay, we're going to hold water systems accountable for these violations, as opposed to the slaps on the wrist, as opposed to the penalties that are just line items that, you know, they won't even miss when they, you know, when they pay those fees. So, so some sort of meaningful, enforcement to keep you know uh water systems from from violating people's bodily integrity uh, you know I, I think those are you know just three overarching things that you know we'd love to see yeah no those are those are great goals i like that so you work in in michigan and illinois is that where your focus is yeah that's correct okay so um what are some what are some success stories that you've you've uh been around or that are underway yeah i you know man they're, they're we've had some really great success, right? And I think a lot of, you know, we, we've seen this big focus on water as you and I, you know, kind of talked about, uh, you know, over, over time, right? Just the Flint water crisis, right? I think that's really prompted a lot of people to mm. pay more attention to water, right? That otherwise hadn't really been taken serious. I mean, you know, folks on the ground impact the communities have been taken serious for decades, right? Because it's our water, but to, to you know, to, to see, you know, you know, less impacted people or agencies starting to pay better attention is, is, has been significant progress. But, you know, starting with Illinois, um, like a few years ago, one instance, you know, Illinois passed, you know, legislation to test for uh, lead in schools, right? And, and this is legislation that, that could be stronger, right? It, it could, you know, have more funding, you know, required, and, and it could, you know, take a more of a, a, a different approach, what we call a filter first approach, right? Um, which would be safer and more economical. But just the idea that, that you have something on the books that's starting to get schools to think about protecting, you know, children in Illinois is a big deal. I know Chicago just rolled out uh, utility building relief program, which, you know, was able to be a part of and work with the city on, on rolling out, which is, you know, a, a, a low income water assistance program. But if you're enrolled in it and, and you pay your, you know, your reduced bill over a certain amount of time on time, you, you get full forgiveness of your bill right after a course of time, if you paid it. Right. So 
your bill could be ten thousand bucks, right? That could, that could have been attached to you for years, but if you can, you know, pay this minimal amount over the course of X amount of time, right, you could get that wiped clean, right? And I think that's a big success to move in the direction of of affordability, right? Um, you know, and, and and even speaking on that, right, there was legislation passed uh, that re- that's going to require the state of Illinois to do a statewide affordability study on drinking water, right? So to so to look around, look across the state and say, okay, this is you know. This is the state of, of water affordability right now, uh, and this is the direction we need to go in to make it more affordable. And that's huge for the state to be able to say, okay, we're actually going to pay attention and, and look into this. Uh, and then I think the biggest news, which came last week, um, was Chicago announcing uh, the implementation of a, a lead service line replacement program, uh, which is going to be huge. Chicago has the most lead service lines in the country, right? Um, and Illinois has the most lead, the state with the most lead service lines in the country as well. So to be able to, you know, to get, a city of that magnitude to say we're we're going to take it seriously. We're actually going to move into the direction of replacing all lead service lines um, is is huge, right? So I think there's there's been big movement on that uh, on the Illinois front, uh, and then you know moving into Michigan, where kind of has been the nexus of drinking water, the drinking water fight for decades, right? Not just the Flint water crisis, but water affordability, water access, trying to maintain you know our, our residents uh, who who fought to create this 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 water system, trying to maintain you know, authority over it in, in, a, in a space where, you know, many folks are trying to regionalize it. But mm. uh, I think the, you know, biggest thing is, is the, uh, we revised the lead and copper rule in Michigan, right? We have the, mm. the most protective lead and copper rule in the country, right? And part of the lead and copper rule was the requirement of the replacement of all lead service lines uh, at the cost of the water system, right? So even those on the private side, uh, that the resident would not have to pay for right out of pocket for it. like that's that's huge right and that was something we were able to, to join a lawsuit in court and defend right so um you know municipalities kind of tried to fight this in court last year and, hmm. and our dc was able to intervene and file an amicus and that's a case that we won right to ensure that you know lead service lines were going to be replaced and that you know residents who couldn't afford it would not be able to you know would not be skipped over on that because that's what we tend to see and the other thing is, you know, at the state level under the current, uh, you know, administration under Whitmer, uh, you know, it may not seem like much, but they created an office of uh, public water advocate and an office of uh, environmental justice. Right. So we have two actual full time employees at the state level whose responsibility is to advocate, you know, for the protection of drinking water for communities and one advocate for broadly environmental justice. And there's obviously a lot of overlap there, but to say there are black women at that, right? Two black women appointed to these roles uh, that, that come out of this advocacy, public health, and environmental justice spaces. Uh, huge. I think, you know, we also just passed the PFAS uh, rulemaking, some of the, with, with some of our uh, compounds that are that are going to be regulated, uh, you know, being some of the most protective in the country as well. And, you know, we passed that for uh, drinking water and in groundwater standards. Uh, you know, and then as, you know, we can't have this conversation without thinking about the current state of COVID, right? COVID, yeah. you know, uh, has, has been uh, detrimental to many communities, especially, you know, low income communities and communities of color where I've been disproportionately impacted. So seeing Michigan, you know, set aside 25 million from federal funds to say, you know, we're going to uh, assist people with water bills to make sure that, you know, when our shutoff moratoriums are over, that people can still have access to water. And then I'll say the last two is just the, you know, the, the introduction of, you know, some bills that we talked about kind of pending what's on the horizon, uh, the intro- introduction of some lead in, in schools bills to as I talked about, you know, filter first and make sure that we're getting lead out of drinking water in schools and doing it in an economical manner and protecting uh, the most vulnerable communities, and, you know, especially our children, and, and as well as a, a, a package of affordability and transparency bills to make sure that, you know, water systems are, um, you know, essentially staying above board. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and I think the, the, the cool thing about all this in, in Illinois and Michigan is, man, just much of this work has been pushed by you know, local advocates impacted the communities who have been, you know, facing these issues for for years, you know, really stepping up and staying in this fight and finally seeing some of the fruits of, of their labor and to be in a position to, you know, support this work from a legal standpoint and a policy standpoint through my work in RDC has, has been great. So it's been great to see some of these successes come to fruition. Still a lot of work to do, for sure, but, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's moving. Oh, I mean, with lead, it is so past time to take that thing on, right? Yeah. That's that's just like even when I was young, it seemed like a thing that was from like the fifties. Lead, yeah. right? Like <laughs> scrape your walls. Is there any lead in the paint in the walls? But it's like yeah. it's crazy how 
pervasive it is. Like you said, Chicago, all those lead lines. Um, that's a big price tag, but it's worth it. It's going to put have yeah. a lot of people working, uh, doing that and everything. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's got to be awesome. Like you said, being around, being involved to see some of this transformative change around policies and dealing with lead and other contaminants. That's, that's good stuff. Well, uh, Jeremy, I really appreciate the time. I'm glad we connected um, and uh, just look forward to continuing to follow all the, the good work you're involved in and that NRDC is involved in on the waterfront. So thanks a ton. Oh, thank you for having me. And thanks for highlighting you know such important issues. Waterloop, Waterloop, Waterloop. The Waterloop Podcast is brought to you by High Sierra Showerheads, the smart and stylish way to save water, energy, and money while enjoying a powerful shower. Use promo code WATERLOOP for 20% off at HighSierraShowerHeads.com. You're in the Waterloop.